we will find and that if we ask, it will be given to us. The second way we change our mindset is, I believe, by asking for divine revelation. In Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, it says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. How do we change our mindsets? We ask questions and we seek for real answers. Two, we ask the Holy Spirit. We say, Lord, I don't understand. Please won't you give me revelation. Please won't you open the eyes of my spirit that I can understand. But folks, we will never do that if we are happy with the status quo. If, if you and I are happy with walking on the ceiling, if we don't want to change our mindset, we're not going to ask the questions. And we're not going to ask for revelation. So the thing starts with a, a divine disease. The thing starts with a, a frame of mind which says, I'm not happy with a life that is characterized by passionlessness and power. We need to be dissatisfied with passionless Christianity. We need to ask big questions and not settle for trite answers anymore. And then we need to ask persistently for revelation. Now all of these things seem to work against each other. I started by saying one of the superficial reasons for passionless and powerless Christianity is that we're all too busy. And, and there's too much happening. It's too much stuff that's happening. And so we seldom get reflective opportunities where we, we, we stop short and start to ask questions. So, so we have to get to a place where we say, I'm not happy with this. I, I'm not going to keep on like a hamster going round and round this treadmill. I'm going to stop and start asking some difficult questions. I'm going to seek until I find them. I believe the cry of the Holy Spirit to our hearts is, stop what you're doing. Seek me. Stop this crazy, reckless obsession with materialism. This helter-skelter ch chase after, after goods. And come to me and ask. Ask the impossible. Ask the big things. And then God will start to open our eyes to the truth of this world that we're living in. The truth of the kingdom of God. The last session was just introductory. Now we're getting to the first session, really, of the series. The session is called Sons and Daughters of the Living God. I'm going to be using the word sons, more or less from now on in. So ladies, whenever you hear the word sons, translate it into and daughters. Okay? There's no gender bias here at all. I'm using it for a number of reasons. One is the scripture talks about sons of God rather than sons and daughters. It was a very sort of male chauvinist society in biblical times. Secondly, it rhymes with slaves. And I'm going to be making this point throughout our session. Sons versus slaves. So ladies, forgive me. This is not an attempt to be offensive. Just read daughters in whenever I say sons. I asked the question, why in general is our Christianity passionless, and powerless. I asked, is it true? And I quoted some statistics from George Barner's latest book. And yeah, it does seem to be true. It seems to, it seems to be a general truth that the church that we live in across the world is essentially Laodicean, lukewarm, in its general attitudes. I talked about inverted kingdoms and so on. And I mentioned the fact that I think one of the greatest underlying reasons is because we do not realize who we are. And this session is all about this. I think that this session is the most important of all seven. I really ask you to listen very carefully, think a lot about what I've got to say 
for the next hour. Because it really does have the potential of stripping those inverted glasses straight off your nose and helping you to think very, very differently about who you are in the kingdom of God. A long time ago, as I mentioned before, when I had hair and when the Rinderpest was still raging South Africa, Peter Sellers made a movie called The Party. I see there's a few fans. Now, it was hilarious. I don't know why I laughed so much at that movie, but I really, it just tickled my funny bone. And he was just a total bumbling idiot in this film. He took the part of an Indian gentleman, complete with turban and all, and then he went around doing outrageous things. And at one point, just after he had done something particularly outrageous, a lady, a very offended lady said, who do you think you are? And his classic response, Madam, in India, we don't think who we are, we know who we are. But in that, in that one-liner, his great profundity, I want to give you a little test in a moment to help you to determine whether you actually do know who you are or to help you to answer the question, who do I think I am? On my last trip to Israel with a group of about 20 folk, we went up to the so-called source of the Jordan River. It's a place called Caesarea Philippi. It's also called Panias, Panias. The actual source of the river is a little bit further north. It's in, in that wonderful mountain called Mount Hebron, where the, sorry, Mount Hermon, where the snow melts and the water comes down underground, but it surfaces here at Panias. Now, it was called Panias because it had a shrine to the god Pan there. All the religions of the day believed that the source of rivers was a very special and mystical place. So they all went and built their temples there. There was a temple for Caesar worship there. There was a temple to the worship of Pan. There was a temple to a number of other so-called gods. And they were all standing in Jesus' day. And he took his disciples to that very same spot that we went to. But nowadays there's just ruins. Then there would have been that whole series of temples. And on that spot he says to his disciples, who do the people say I am? And then they responded, some say this and some say that. And then he looks at Peter and he says, and who do you say I am? And the response was, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then remember he said, to Peter, you know, you didn't know that yourself. That was revealed to you by my Father. Now, what would have happened if Jesus had turned to Peter, I wonder, just idle speculation, and said, and who do you say you are, Peter? I wonder how he would have defined himself. Oh, I'm a fisherman. I'm your disciple. Now, if Jesus had to look you in the eye, even tonight, and ask you that question, who do you say you are? How would you answer? What is the thing that is, defines you most, in, you, in your own opinion? Put a bonus survey again, just to give you a little bit of extra data. He found that a fraction, a fraction, a minority of Christians, defined their success in terms of spiritual values. When he asked them, as a Christian, how do you define success? They would say things like, oh, I'm making lots of money, you know, rising high in my organization, bringing up a good family. And I think it was one out of ten was the statistic that actually said, I believe it's, I'm successful if I have a relationship with Jesus. See, in a similar vein, how would you define yourself? Oh, you're a mother, you're a father, you're a business person, you're all those things. But how do you primarily define yourself? Okay, here's this little question that I'm going to ask you. I've called it a black and white questionnaire because there are no shades of grey. Now, it's really unfair, I must warn you. Don't you hate those TV shows when the, when the attorney looks at the first sucker in the witness stand and says, just yes or no, please? And the guy's got to say yes or no. And you know perfectly well that there's no ways that that's a yes or no answer. And, and the witness tries desperately to add extra words. And I just asked you, yes or no, please. It's one of those. There's no shades of gray. That's why I've called it a black and white quiz. Here's the good news. 
you don't have to tell anybody what the answers are. And I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you to put your hands up and say how many you got that were white answers and how many that you got were black answers. Write them down on a piece of paper, though. And if you don't have a piece of paper, then use your right hand. In, in true old South African tradition, the white will equal on the right. Exactly. And the black will be on the left. It's a nice political statement. But if you have a pen and paper, then just write W or B. Here are the questions. Do you regard God as your Lord and Master, generally, or as your Father? No, I know there's shades between them, so you just make a black or white decision on this one. To you, is God more your Lord and Master, or is he more your Father? Make a quick response. If it's Lord and Master, just put a tick in the white column. Predominantly Father, put a tick in the black column. The second question. Do you believe that generally God is responsible for the things of life? After all, he's foreordained all things, and so he's accountable, he's responsible. Or do you generally believe that you're responsible for most of the things that happen in your life? And again, forget about the arguing about the shades of grey, just go for the poles here, one or the other. Particularly in your church life, particularly in your spiritual life, do you regard yourself as being motivated more by fear than by love or vice versa. By fear, I mean, I've got to obey the rules, I've got to do what's expected of me, because if I don't, somebody is going to clout me. Lightning shall strike. Or one of the elders will come knocking on my door. Or am I driven, really, and motivated more by a deep love that I have for God? Next question. Do I regard myself as performance-driven or relationship-drawn? How do I measure myself? Am I measuring myself in terms of how I'm performing? We used to have a member of this congregation whose favorite prayer was, How am I doing with you, Lord? How do you think he saw himself? Performance-driven, right? Or do you see yourself as drawn drawn with the cords of love into a relationship with God, drawn into a relationship with your fellow believers. Make a response. I know it's quite hard, but just go for it. Do you see yourself as having an arm's length relationship with God or an intimate relationship with God? I'll give you the clue. How do you start your prayers? If your prayers start, Almighty God, most beloved Father, ruler of all the universes, I come to you today, etc., well then I think you just might have an arm's length relationship as opposed to Father. I've been so looking forward to talking with you. I'm so glad to be here with you. What are you? Are you drawn into intimate relationship? Or do you find yourself really more at an arm's length with God? Hmm. Particularly in church life, guys. Particularly in the expression of your faith through the, uh, the organs of Christianity, if you can call it that. Are you a getter or a giver? Do you rush to give? Is it your delight to give of your time, your talent, and your money resources? Or, if you're really honest and nobody's looking at your answers, are you centered on what can I get? How much did I enjoy it? Did I get my money's worth? Did people notice me? Did they say hello? Etc. Do I do the minimum or do I invest the maximum? That's a general life question, but I'm looking particularly at spiritual things. And again, I'm looking particularly at the application in and through the church. Do I do the minimum to get by? Or do I invest the maximum of myself into the kingdom of God? Do I actually think that God needs me to do stuff? Or do I believe that God loves me to be who I am? When I'm really honest, do I, is my mentality, well, if I don't do this thing, I'm going to let God down. I've heard myself, you say, using these words, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. So he needs you to do stuff, right? 
Or do you think that he just wants a relationship with it because of who you are? Does he want you to be? Last question. God predetermines everything that happens. Or God has given me some discretion to determine a meaningful amount of what happens. Again, it's a black or white question here, I'm afraid. Now, here's the test. Definitely not showing your spouse. Please just run through your mental list or your pencil list or your fingers. What predominates? Do you have more whites than blacks or more blacks than whites? If you have more white answers than black answers, then in truth, you see yourself more as a slave than as a son. Now, I'm using the word slave because it's an extreme statement. I could say servant, but I want to talk about servants because we are servants as well. So I'm talking about two mentalities, black and white, a slave mentality or a son mentality. So, so now if the Lord had to say to you, based on those results, my friend, who do you say you are? You glance down at your piece of paper and you would say, in all truth and honesty, Father, I see myself as a slave. You're a slave. Or you glance down at these results and you say, generally speaking, Father, I understand and I define myself as a son, your son, as a daughter, your daughter. I want to move in the next segment to Jesus' example and what the scriptures have to say about that. So let's root ourselves in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, interesting thing is in terms of Jesus' example, he quite clearly ministered out of his understanding of who he was. And the choice example is in John 13, verses 3 to 5, which reads, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel, that was wrapped around them. You know the story. It's the Last Supper. Peter and John had been sent by Jesus to prepare the meal. In all probability, they had set it out in a U-shaped table, which was common in those days. It was a Roman design that was adopted by all Roman occupied territories. So it's very likely that it wasn't a one single long table like you see in all the oil paintings. It would have been U-shaped, and very low. They wouldn't have been sitting in chairs as in the Da Vinci Code. They would have been reclining on cushions, kind of half stretched out. Now the positioning around that table was very important. The host, the person who was officiating, would sit second from the end on the one arm of the U. To his right would be the person who had organized. So the master of ceremonies would sit there. The most important invited guest would sit on his left. And then in order of importance, they would all be arranged around that you until they came to the very far end. If you can imagine it, it's you like so. Here's where all the main manas sit. And the most lowly guest of all would be sitting opposite them on the other side of the open you. Now when a person arrived for a meal, the servant in the house was supposed to wash their feet because they were full of dust from traveling. And if there was no servant present, if it was a poor home that had no, no paid help, then the least important person had the responsibility of washing the feet. I had this experience in, in, in that same trip to Israel that I was describing. We had this recreation of the Passover supper. And we all came in and it was a sort of a low, kind of a muddy, bricky, baked room. And there was this U-shaped table. And on it was um, lamb stew and bits of bread that we could break and so on and so forth. 
And the person who was organizing it said, please just come in and, and sit down. So folk came in and they started sitting all around the table. We didn't know that there was any particular order. We were just told to sit. Something inside me said, just hold back. Let everybody in first and sit last when everybody's seated. I remember our tour guide was over there and he was saying, come, come and sit over here. I've I said, just let everybody sit. And then they all sat and there was only one place left. Right next to the door, that last little end seat. So I sat in it. So then the lady who was conducting this said, um, where's your pastor sitting? And I said, here. And she said, well, you'll see why, but you're sitting exactly where you should. So oh, that's pretty cool. And then she explained. Over there would have been sitting Jesus. On his right would have been John. On his left would have been Judas Iscariot. Now, very interesting, but you can actually work it out from the scriptures that he was to the left of Jesus. Jesus took the bread, dipped it in the stew, and passed it to him. We know that John was sitting on his other side because he leant back on his chest and asked him some questions a bit later on. So Jesus had given Judas Iscariot, the one to betray him, the greatest place of honor. And then they would have gone in all the way down until the most least important servant of the lot, that's where I was sitting. And that's where Peter would have been sitting. And Peter would have been sitting there humping. I'm the next king of the castle. Jesus told me I'm going to be the leader of the church. And, and look where I'm sitting. He expected me to wash feet. You've got to be joking. And then it says this. Jesus, knowing where he had come from and where he was going, Jesus, knowing who he was, God the Son, strips down takes the bowl and towel and washes their feet all the way around until he gets to Peter. Jesus served in the most menial and humble way because he knew who he was. Peter refused to serve because he thought he knew who he was. He thought he was the big man. But Jesus realized that he was God the Son. And because he was God the Son, it was his pleasure to serve. It was his joy to serve. Let me take you through a couple of scriptures. The first one is Ephesians 1, verse 5. Ephesians 1, verse 5 says this. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Okay. What are we predestined to be? Sons and daughters of the living God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. One thing we have to settle. If we want to get our world inverted... We want to change our mindset. We need to realize that the moment that you were born again of the Spirit of God, you became a son or a daughter of the Most High. Of course you serve. We are sons and daughters born to serve. But we are not slaves. We are sons. That does not make us kingdom kids. You remember about 15, 20 years ago, everybody was running around talking about, oh, I'm a kingdom kid. I can have what I want. I can make lots of money. Uh -uh. It's not kingdom kids. 